All right, panelists, we are now live on both Facebook and Zoom, and you can switch your cameras on. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome, Bana, welcome, Catherine, Khaled, Miles, and Shane. Um, welcome to everyone at home. People are still um, kind of coming in. I'm going to try and let things settle a little bit. Um, good evening to everybody and a big welcome to you at home. Um, thank you so much for joining us. This is Colonialism is Not Charity. And we are joined by Bana Abu Zalouf, Catherine Ravi, Miles Howe, Shane Martinez, and Khaled Muammar. Um, and today, our event um, on Canadian charities and Palestinian dispossession um, is really uh, about the need to defund racism. Um, so my name is Bianca Mageni, and I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, um, which is an organization that challenges unjust uh, foreign policy measures. And um, we are the host and co-organizer of today's event alongside Just Peace Advocates. And um, I want to thank our co-sponsors as well, the Good Shepherd Collective and Defunding Racism. So the Institute is based in Montreal or Jojage on the territory of the Ganyangihaga people and the keepers of the Eastern door of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And you can find out more about our work at foreignpolicy.ca um, where you can also donate um, to help us continue this work. And you can find out about Just Peace Advocates at justpeaceadvocates.ca. So thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, to our audience, um, it's great to see so many of you on the call um, at the event. Um, so for today's event, speakers are gonna give their opening remarks and, um, and then we're gonna take questions from you, our audience for about half an hour following that. So please do put your questions in the Q and A box. It's much easier for us to find them there than in the chat. Um, the chat is open, um, and as always, please do keep your marks, uh, remarks civil, cordial, and, and free from harmful commentary. Um, Karen Rodman from Just Peace Advocates is going to be putting useful links and actions, uh, resources in the chat, and we'll also be emailing all of these to uh, all those who registered for the event. Also, just want to um, give a hearty thanks to Karen Rodman for bringing together our speakers for this important discussion. So today's event is called Colonialism is Not Charity. Um, in some terrible but related news today in Israel, um, today Israel massacred nine more people in Jenin. Um, and uh, tonight's event is about, uh, you know, what may be Canada's most important contribution to Palestinian dispossession. Um, it's on the need to expose and stop Canadian charities from contributing to the subjugation and the displacement of Palestinians. So just a little bit of background information. Um, the Canada Revenue, Revenue Agency or CRA grants charitable status to um, organizations that raise between somewhere between a quarter and half a billion dollars annually for projects in Israel. And they subsidize donations to a number of groups um, within these that support West Bank settlements, explicitly racist institutions or the, the Israeli military, um, as well as those uh, set up by, um, by folks close to ministers in the new extremist, gov extremist government. And another quick technical context for the discussion, um, registered charities receive benefits from the CRA. So they're exempt from paying certain taxes, can provide tax receipts for donations. When individuals donate, they can write that off in their taxes and depending on the bracket, this can reach up to 40% of a donation effectively subsidized by taxpayers. So, if a very wealthy individual, for instance, donates $10 million, they can get upwards of $4 million off their tax bill. If $300 million, for instance, was raised by Canadian charities uh, for Israel each year, that could work out to something like $100 million of Canadian taxpayer support. So Just Peace Advocates um, and others, uh, CFPI, Just Peace Advocates and others have been working to pressure the CRA to apply its own rules to stop registered charities from funding West Bank settlements, racist organizations, and the Israeli military. <laughs> Excuse me. A formal complaint was also recently submitted um, to the CRA calling for an audit of the charitable status of the, I think it's Naaman Foundation. Um, Khaled, you'll help me uh, with the pronunciation of that. The Naaman Foundation, which funds organizations promoting West Bank settlements, um, racist policies, uh, and the IDF. 
So another formal complaint was recently submitted um, regarding registered charities uh, funding racist extremist groups in Israel, uh, Regavim and Ir David, which I think we'll, we may also hear about uh, tonight. It's also worth noting that organizations um, like Naaman receive large percentages of their donations from other charity organizations and foundations. So um, those donating organizations actually also need to be investigated. So with that background uh, out of the way, it's now my great, great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the evening, uh, Bana Abuzuluf. Welcome, Bana. Thank you so much for having me. Um, as you said, today is quite a very harsh day on Palestinians, um, specifically those that are away from home and feel a bit uh, helpless, uh, not able to do much uh, and then not able to grieve. Um, but of course, this makes it more, you know, of an urgent need to act. For my presentation, in fact, today, uh, hopefully I will be able to finish in 10 minutes that I'm given to present today. But I will be uh, presenting in three parts. Um, the first part, I will be talking about active settler frontiers uh, beginning from the case of Al-Naqab Bedouin communities and then Masafir Yattan and the current uh, case of Khan al-Ahmar in the Jerusalem periphery. The second part, I will be talking about specifically Regavim settler organization. And then I will be discussing the threat of displacement against Khan al-Ahmar, the recent uh, case. And then the last thing I will be talking about the Defund Racism campaign, which is led by the Good Shepherd Collective and many other organizations in the US and Canada and, and a larger coalition of Palestinian NGOs as well. Um, before um, I start, um, I would just like to mention that uh, a bit of a background uh, on how uh, Israel maintains these uh, discriminant policies uh, building uh, permit policies and how they end up controlling Palestinian land. Uh, the first uh, way that they and uh, that Israel enacts uh, policies to control Palestinian land in Area C specifically is by declaring land nature reserves, military zones, state land, firing zones, seeing zones, and so on. Uh, as you know, of course, after uh, the Oslo Agreement, uh, Palestinian uh, land in the West Bank was divided to Area A, B and C, and Area C is, is heavily targeted uh, for demolitions and for forced displacement of Palestinian communities. And due to discriminant zoning and planning policies enacted by the State of Israel and by the civil administration, Palestinians, in fact, became stuck in a catch-22 situation. So, as you know, Palestinians are required to have building permits. Uh, but Palestinians also apply for these building permits, and only 6% of these building permits yearly are approved. Uh, we're talking about larger uh, uh, permits being sent into the civil administration, and only 6%. That means uh, a lot of them are prevented from having building permits. And in, essentially, this uh, green lights the displacement because uh, civil administration will come up and uh, send a demolition order to the, the Palestinian house or to the community at large. Essentially, these systems of laws or what I call, what I like to call um, pseudo legalities allow for the, you know, emboldening of settler groups, including the settler organization Regavim, who targets the presence and calls for displacement of Palestinian people. Now, from 1948 until today, the Nakba, the Nakab, sorry, has been uh, at the biggest settler frontier because of a large presence of Palestinian Bedouins in the area, and because uh, Palestinian Bedouins have been always targeted, and their communities continuously called unrecognizable. This has called, of course, for a wave of demolition, including, you know, uh, um, Tel Arad, where many of the communities currently. Uh, have moved to live in the West Bank, and then Al Arakib uh, Bedouin community, which was demolished all, more than two hundred times, and then um, Umm Al Hiran Bedouin community, which, uh, among others, is is currently the closest to the so called Green Line, and the closest uh, and, and the continuously under uh, a threat of displacement and uh, demolition. 
Um, again, now, now, nowadays we've been hearing about the, the case of Masafir Yatta, has become the newest settler frontier, and it's in close proximity to the so-called uh, Green Line. In fact, it's, uh, um, it's eastern to the Green Line. And, and various settlement blocks in South Herbal Hills, in fact, sandwich uh, these Bedouin communities in Masafir in Yatta. And those who live currently in Masafir Yatta are under threat of displacement because of these settlement blocks. Um, this, of course, made it an easy target for Palestinians. And currently, Palestinians are uh, under threat. Currently, Palestinians are experiencing another Nakba. And of course, the silence is deafening. What's happening again in Khan al-Shamar is no short of this, of this construct, but it's slightly more complicated. The reason why Khan al-Ahmar case is a bit more complicated because of an Israeli plan in the area called the E1 plan. Khan al-Ahmar falls in the Jerusalem periphery, sandwiched between the Ma'ali Adami settlement uh, complex and block and between J uh, Jerusalem. That makes it, of course, uh, again, an easy target for displacement, specifically that these Bedouin communities, you know, are precarious and could not uh, support themselves and continuously feel the need to remain present in those lands, despite not having uh, access to building permits and being denied those building permits uh, uh, continuously. And this so-called uh, E1 area, in fact, constitute the newest settler frontier. And these uh, settler communities, uh, these, uh, sorry, uh, these communities have been the target because in fact, uh, uh, they constitute whole communities. It, there has been the constant uh, targeting of individual houses in Jerusalem and in many areas around the West Bank, but it is in fact the, the newest case after Masafir Yatta where uh, whole Bedouin communities are targeted. This is very alarming because this reminds us again of the Nakba, because people, they're not targeting individual houses, they're targeting whole communities. They're looking to relocate whole communities. They're looking to forcibly displace whole communities. Again, uh, because of the fact that it's close uh, proximity to settlement block, it is targeted. But again, there's a reason why Khan al Ushmal is targeted more than other communities, which are again, 18 communities in the A1 zone, E1 zone. The reason why is because uh, uh, it is in close proximity to a highway that links Mali Adamim to Jericho. This is, of course, very important because the moment that Mali Adamim becomes connected to Jerusalem and then they have access to Jer Jericho as well, this bisects the West Bank into two. And then that means the people who live in northern area of the West Bank will not be able to reach the southern area of the West Bank. Of course, again, the people who believe in the two-state solution can understand how this completely, uh, uh, you know, kills the two-state solution. Not that it was alive before. Recently, however, uh, the 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 Khan al case rose up to the surface. The reason the reason why this uh, case rose up to the surface is because the Israeli High Court decision, which resp responding to Ragavim's um, petition in two thousand eighteen, decided that uh, to green light the the eviction of Khan al Ahmar community. However, because of pressure, international uh, pressure it helped put a stop to this displacement at that time. Recently, however, the right-wing uh, fascist government, in fact, and its finance minister, as you all know, uh, Bezalel Smotrich and his uh, political right-hand Itamir bin Kever, decided to push the government to adhere to the court's decision requiring, requiring them to demolish the community immediately. This is not only alarming, uh, an alarming expression, sorry, of the goals and aims of this new government, but it also is a compass directing us to the biggest perpetrator. The biggest perpetrator in, in this is the settler organization, Regavim. Regavim settler organization, in fact, was created by Bezalil Smotrich himself. So again, we can see why Bezalil Smotrich is eager to push for the displacement of Khan Lahmar. 
Now, is, is, if Khan Ahmad is demolished and is, its residents displaced, this could constitute a war crime, as it on, obviously falls under the category of forced displacement. Again, Regavim and Israel are gearing towards committing a war crime, and there's little to no action being done at the moment to stop this, even though uh, previously it has been you know, uh, the case. Nowadays, you can tell that it's not uh, uh, getting enough attention in the media. We could understand that there's a gravity to the situation right now because of this lack of action. Regavim is a settler organization despite its heinous work assisting the Israeli government to ethnically cleanse Palestinians, is in fact receiving millions of tax deducted money yearly. This, is, uh, this money is given from charities, so-called charities, um, in the US and Canada. And of course, uh, many of the speakers today will, uh, will be speaking specifically about foundations, so I will leave that to them to speak about. Um, but for these organizations, for these organizations to send in money to these settler groups who commit war crimes, we can say this is also in violation of international law, but also in violation of state policies. Charitable organizations, in fact, should not be financing the dispossession of Palestinians. It's very simple. The defund racism campaign, in fact, was born out of the need to stop this flow of money to these organizations, including Regavim, including Dear David. You can find more information about that on uh, the defundracism.org. I'm sure Karen kindly put the link in the chat. These, uh, these uh, defund racism campaign, in fact, is also uh, eager to and keen to expose these organizations for what they are, Zionist fascist organizations, which are waiting to green light another Nakba. Uh, this is evident, of course, in the rise of harassment by settlers towards Palestinians in currently in Masafriyatta, but also in Khan al Ahmed. Uh, again, we're, we're looking into uh, finding ways to stop this flow of money to these organizations. You can find more uh, information again in the defund racism website uh, and details about how uh, we intend to uh, to act uh, against these organizations in fact also it's crucial to strategically tackle the system and in order to do so we need to look at these organizations and try to find uh, uh, how much they send money to these organizations and also uh, in which ways we can revoke their charitable status. Uh, in some ways, of course, our speakers have spoken, uh, have, uh, will speak, uh, my apologies, will speak about, uh, uh, about how uh, uh, several um, uh, freedom of uh, inquiry, freedom of information has been sent and complaints have been sent to the revenue agency to, uh, to look into these, uh, uh, the, the, the tax audits of these organizations and, and supposed charities. And it's important to expose their criminal links again, uh, but eventually the, the goal here is to revoke the charitable status of these organizations. And this is one thing that the Defund Racism campaign is looking onto, specifically in the state of New York. Uh, and then you can, of course, again, see more about the campaign uh, on the Defund Racism uh, website, and then you can also uh, uh, sign the petition. I would also like to conclude by mentioning that it is incomprehensible that despite the ICC prosecutor committing to visit the occupied Palestinian territory this year, which is considered, again, a, a very important step for, towards accountability for Palestinian civil society, that Israel continues to feel emboldened to carry out their policies of displacement and various annexationist and apartheid policies. In fact, we can easily say that the international community is responsible for maintaining Israel's impunity and greenlighting Palestinian displacement. Uh, again, for the title of, this, uh, of today's uh, uh, webinar, indeed, colonialism is not a charity. And we, uh, in the Defund Racism Campaign, the Good Shepherd Collective, we urge institutions to take it seriously to defund these settler entities. And now, immediately, so that we can stop the eminent displacement of Palestinians from their land 
and currently from Khan Lahmar community, from Masafa Yatta and from Naqa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bana, for that uh, brilliant presentation, for all those critical details, the activities of settler communities, displacement, um, the plight of the Bedouins, and, and your very important work with Defund Racism, the campaign. Um, it's really great to hear all those strategies uh, for action around these organizations that are funding uh, all of this injustice. Um, and I forgot to mention earlier that uh, Bana is a Palestinian researcher and a PhD student in international law at the National University of Ireland, Maynus. She's the research and communication officer at the Good Shepherd Collective uh, organization, and her research spans the topics of Bedouin communities, epistemic oppression, intersectional solidarity, decolonization, and international law vulnerabilities. So you can find out more um, about her work and about this uh, Palestinian-led campaign to end the use of charitable funds um, in countries, including Canada, um, to fund settler violence and extremism at defundracism.org. The link is in the chat. And you can also find out more about uh, Good Shepherd Collective on Facebook. Um, so yeah, we don't have to look beyond uh, our own borders to challenge apartheid. We can actually do this here at home by looking at some of these organizations and the work that they're funding. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing more from you, Bana, in the Q&A. Our next speaker of the evening is Catherine Ravi. Catherine joined Al Haq as a business and human rights legal researcher in 2021 after working at a law firm litigating civil rights violations such as police brutality, wrongful conviction, and racial discrimination. She holds a master's in human rights law from University College London and has worked for the Tahiri Justice Center where she advocated for immigrant survivors of gender-based violence. She was a Werner Fornos Fellow at the Population Institute, uh, where she conducted qualitative data analysis to measure the effectiveness of reproductive health education in rural Haiti, and a Mame Riley Fellow, where she worked with the Democratic National Women's Caucus to expand women's political efficacy. She's worked with nonprofit organizations in India, advocating for women's access to secondary education, and in Northern Ireland, pr promoting peaceful reconciliation within divided communities. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much. Thank you for that <laughs> far too kind introduction. Uh, it is uh, an honor to be here and especially um, uh, as I'm very happy that we can spend this day together uh, after the massacre in Janine. Um, truly horrific thing to uh, wake up to today. So I hope we can all find some solidarity and some peace in discussing um, really this important topic. Um, and Bana, thank you so much for everything you said. Actually, a lot of what I have to say is very much, I'm gonna really build off of that because you've done a fantastic job of laying the foundations for exactly what is happening in, in, in Israel's um, plan to disenfranchise the Palestinian people and, and really divide and remove um, the Palestinian presence in their historic land. Um, and I think one of the ways I'm going to highlight is on uh, businesses and charities, um, because one thing I think that's important to remember in all of this is that this is a this is an international multi-million dollar scheme um, that involves a lot of dis different industries. Um, I mean, as as Bana mentioned, there's a huge legal framework that Israel implements to uh, absorb land, take resources. Um, natural resources, water, mobility. Um, it really is trying to um, basically minimize and disenfranchise um, and displace Palestinians all over um, Palestine. And another way that they are able to do that is through international financing and profits. Um, and not just in terms of money, but also in terms of, of tools um, and machines, for example, um, I mean, I, I, won't, I won't go into this, but there's too much I could say on this, but a lot of uh, Israel's appropriation of Palestinian water resources rely on foreign technologies um, to like, um, uh, what I'm trying to say, like bulldozers to diminish water infrastructures, as well as um, products for uh, desalination plants, which uh, again, I'm not gonna go into, but the point is, is that there is a, there, none of this, would be possible without foreign investments. And this goes beyond just foreign policies and foreign law and international law, because we're talking about the engagement of a private sector um, in really all aspects of this displacement. And charities play a huge role in that. 
Uh, and I think it's important to also remember and keep in mind that for many Israelis and, and for the Israeli state, they don't see the West Bank as a, as a place for Palestinians, they see it as a. I mean, they name that area Judea and Samaria. Um, it's it's uh, they as a as kind of a tool to um, I guess show that there that all of that land is meant to be Israel and is awaiting Judaization as it should be. And so this is a common tool that is used to displace and to really erase Palestinian heritage and history and really rewrite this entire idea um, that Palestinians have uh, a right to be there um, and have always been there. And it really erases this very problematic history. So I just wanna step back from all of that and use a, 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 an example of this. Um, and I know Bana was talking about the E1 zone, uh, which is definitely the frontier of, of new settlements um, and settler colonial uh, framework. And one of the ways they're doing that is by using Canadian tax dollars to um, basically implement this fictional illegal settlement called the city of David, um, which can be found in East, Eastern Jerusalem uh, in the Palestinian village of Silwan. And what the city of David is, if none of you have been to Jerusalem, is it's a um, an archaeological site um, that Israel has decided to claim as an exclusively Jewish archaeological site um, that is meant to bolster the claim that the area once hosted this biblical city of David. Now, archaeologists have at the site have found many prehistoric and historic periods in this tourist site that holds a very rich fabric of the Byzantine and Islamic periods that are basically <laughs> pretty much erased from the narrative. So when tourists come in and are, and are seeing structures that existed from those periods in the 14th centuries and you know, bathhouses and hammams and all these things, they're told that these are just remnants of the, uh, or, or findings of the Jewish first temple. And it basically really turns a lot of Palestinian heritage into an exhibit on Jewish ancestry. And of course, anyone who knows about the history of this place knows that there's a lot of interconnection between all these groups. But what this illegal Israeli settlement is trying to tell, basically tell tourists is that uh, Palestinians never were here and they try to erase this narrative. And uh, in fact, so much so that uh, an 11th century Muslim cemetery was actually found at the site and was dismantled. Uh, and several dozen skeletons and skulls and bone fragments from the early Islamic period were removed without inspection, filling you know, hundreds of boxes and, uh, and stored somewhere else and eventually buried away from the site. So this is a obvious destruction and misappropriation of Palestinian cultural property. Um, and it's really a hallmark of Israel's settler colonial enterprise. Um, and this obviously doesn't just have an attack on the historical narrative of Palestinians' presence in the region, but also has a lot to do with present day Palestinians. For example, this site is built on Palestinian land in East Jerusalem, and many Palestinian families were forcibly displaced to make way for this tourist site. And the uh, the Palestinian neighborhoods that still exist around the site have had structural damage due to the excavations that are happening under their homes. And of course, they would never had any say in how this was. You know, if they were if they were okay with their homes having excavation underneath. And you have you know, families whose homes are now structurally unsound and are having to, of course, move and be forcibly displaced, again, to make way for this uh, fake city of David. And it's important to remember that this, uh, these sites draw in thousands and thousands of tourists each year. In fact, on TripAdvisor, it was the number one site to see in Jerusalem. And it's you know, when you're a tourist and you don't know anything about this, you're coming in and you're getting all these tours and you're getting, you're, you're being told a very specific narrative and uh, a very washed down version of history to support the Judaization of, of Jerusalem and also to kind of expand into, you know, I guess, enlarge uh, Jerusalem 
uh, the Jewish sector of Jerusalem and to basically erase Palestinians' existence there. And a lot of companies that support this, um, including those um, by Elad, which is supported by Canadian tax dollars, um, and of course TripAdvisor and all these other things, really contribute to the profitability of these illegal settlements. Um, and again, this is just one example, but you can understand how um, really Israel's using a lot of different frameworks to displace and erase Palestinians. They're taking land, they're um, using international profits to um, profit off of a kind of a bastardization of history. They're forcibly removing Palestinians and illegally transferring in um, Israeli populations into what is a Palestinian neighborhood. Um, and there are so many violations of international law and I'm trying to be more surface level with all of this to kind of give you an idea of what how this all happens. Um, but it's, so, I mean, it, as you can see, it's a well-oiled machine and all of this is very, very intentional um, and resources and land and even Palestinian presence in areas that even according to the Oslo Accords, they have ownership of are being displaced and removed and shrunk um, to really erase Palestinians existence in this land um, altogether. So I think it's, as, um, as it was mentioned, it's very important to recognize that your own government has a lot of, has a huge hand in this and also has a lot of ability to prevent this. Um, and also even in, within yourselves, I know I have a lot of friends that tour to Israel and they get absorbed into these tourist schemes. Um, so it's important to be aware of all the ways that we can combat this through even just our daily actions and through knowledge sharing. So I thank you all for coming to this because um, it's really important to have this conversation. And I uh, look forward to hearing from the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, for all those important details. Um, yeah, just so much that I learned there around the, the third party funding, as well as some historical context, the destruction of Palestinian cultural property, violations of international law, you know, for highlighting the shrinking space of, uh, you know, civil society in Palestine and the implications that this has. Um, just a lot that you were able to fit into 10 minutes. And, and also thank you so much for your amazing activism and um, just such a long history of uh, promoting justice and human rights. Um, so I do invite you to follow Catherine's work at alhaq.org and to check out um, the City of David, uh, which is a report that uh, Alhaq put out, which Catherine edited. Um, so there are there are nearly 200 of us participating live in today's um, event, which is wonderful. It's amazing to see um, such interest in such an important topic and and some and a place where we really can take action, as Catherine uh, mentioned. Um, also, for those of you who are asking, uh, yes, we will be rebroadcasting this discussion to both YouTube and uh, and Facebook. Um, so yeah, subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll get immediate notifications. Also, a reminder to put your questions in the Q&A box so that we can get to them. So our next speaker of the evening is Dr. Miles Howe. Um, Miles is an assistant professor of critical criminology at Brock University. His interests include policing tactics, protest movements, and surveillance. His PhD research centered on tracking the importation of Anglo-American neoliberal obedient epistemologies into Canada specifically within Canadian academia. Um, this work is ongoing and focuses particularly on mapping the extent of the permeations of this network, as well as outlining the impacts that such importations have had upon Canadian securitization priorities and policies. In November 2022, Dr. Howe was an author of International Cash, Conduits, and Real Estate Empires, a case study in Canadian philanthropic crime, which was published in the journal of White Collar and Corporate Crimes got to get a subscription to that, where he analyzed 20 years of tax data to identify a pattern of regulatory violation that they call the burner charity phenomenon. Welcome, Miles. Thanks a lot. Um, the article is open access, so you don't need a subscription. Um, I'm going to do a little uh, PowerPoint presentation here. Just bear with me while we get this set up. <clears throat> Thanks. Can
Yeah, we can see it. I gotta get this out of the way here. One sec. Okay, so uh, yeah, thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, myself and my colleague, Dr. Paul Sylvester, had a look into um, charitable tax files uh, from the CRA. And yeah, we, we coined a term called burner and anchor charities, which I'd like to describe right now. <clears throat> Oops, sec. Okay, so uh, I had been working on um, developing a methodology related to developing uh, access to information wording that would allow us to access um, unredacted charity gifting patterns across Canada. And so when I say that, what I mean is uh, inter-charity donations. As we know, um, there's a black box when it comes to individual charitable donations. Uh, that information is not you know, allowed for the public. But when money moves between charitable organizations, that's something that you can get at. And so while it's not the whole picture of how these uh, organizations operate, it is a significant portion of their financing. Um, specifically, what I was interested here was to view gifting patterns between private foundations, which are not something generally like you or I or people at a working class level are able to um, organize, but are more linked to family fortunes, the elite or the ultra rich, and their donation patterns to more frontline charitable organizations. Um, <clears throat> who are the ultra rich giving to and why was the general question. Uh, a charity that had been revoked due to a failed audit uh, called Beit Olaf was the first charity on our radar. And this we sort of stumbled across. Uh, I won't really bore you with uh, how that happened. All that to say, uh, in developing this wording, we were able to acquire uh, a 20 year data set related to Beth Olaf in particular, firstly, in terms of who, uh, from a charitable standpoint, what kind of foundations had given to them. And so we were able to see um, not only, uh, you know, the revenue that Beth Olaf was operating with, not only the fact that it was sending much of the money overseas um, to Israel and uh, the United States specifically, but um, who was actually giving them that money. And so that became a piece that we we then sort of ran with and became quite interested with to um, uh, given that we had a two decade period of time to sort of tease out more data. And I'll show you how we did that. <clears throat> um, specifically related to Beth Olaf, firstly, as I said, using a specific wording, we were able to acquire unredacted. Data Olaf had received in multi decade spreadsheets. And Beth Olaf was a key piece of this because the CRA had revoked its charitable status uh, due to a variety of factors, one of them being that it had been funding uh, operations within the occupied West Bank, as well as providing uh, support services to the IDF. And so it represented something that we knew was a transgressor of the Income Tax Act, right? So it was a good starting point. Uh, what we found and what was sort of replicable across um, uh, uh, a bunch of synchronously linked uh, charities that we were to discover was that Beth Olaf specifically, as with the rest of these that we found, were typified by a period of dormancy. And so Beth Olaf was organized as a charity in around 2000. Uh, it's in the paper that we wrote, the, the specific date escapes me, but between 2000 and 2011 did very little to no actual charitable activity. And so we don't actually know why this happened, but we suspect it's a matter of building credibility with whatever uh, risk matrices the CRA uses in order to sort of begin to red flag charities if they operate out of proportion to um, the level of finance they're receiving or the level of uh, employment structures that they're they're disclosing to the CRA. Uh, whatever the reason following, you know, over a decade of lack of action, there's a massive upswing in inter-charity donations. And so it begins to receive in 2012 into 2018 from literally tens of thousands of dollars a year into the millions, into the tens of millions per year. And as we know from that revoked audit, that money and from its own um, uh, tax returns, that money is moving overseas. And it's also linked into, um, in this case, thousands of agents, mostly in Israel, 
uh, also in the United States. Uh, and as we know in common law, the actions of your agents are your responsibility. And so you can name an agent under the Income Tax Act. That agent does not need to be uh, a charity in and of itself. The logic being that someone on the ground in a country where you wish to do charitable work might have more knowledge of where to put resources than you would. And so that's an understood, um, you know, that's a that's okay under the Income Tax Act. But you do need to have some kind of contractual uh, paper trail that if the CRA comes knocking with an audit, you need to demonstrate to them that your organization and that those agents are working in some kind of contractual arrangement where they're performing the charitable work that you claim that they're doing. Uh, Beth Olaf and the rest of these uh, charities calling them arrangements in place and that was one of the key factors that led to their revocation and so it's literally a matter of naming several thousand agents poof the money's gone uh no idea where this is going and when the cra eventually comes knocking at your door to ask where that is there's no track record of where that has gone and that's a common phenomenon across what we're call calling these burner charities uh the the paper trail that we received was um very, very, you know, statistically interesting in terms of watching that dormancy period into this massive escalation, and then watching it come from a variety of private foundations. Uh, certainly became interested in in what actually was going on. I had never, you know, my 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 knowledge of tax law, uh, my dealing with CRA access to information requests was sort of limited at this point. This wasn't, you know, my first trip to the tax law rodeo, but I had never seen anything like what this was. And so what we then did is rephrase the question to, um, <clears throat> to we felt that these private foundations would be some kind of uh, queryable uh, piece of interest to this puzzle. If we could see where they were giving their money to with Beth Olaf, what we then did is rephrased our initial question. And so rather than asking intercharitable receipts that Beth Olaf had received, we asked for intercharity donations that these private foundations that had suddenly become of interest to us, who they had been giving to over a period of two decades. And so we were able to not only see from this sort of frontline operation where that money is going to, i.e. we don't know. And so this is a transgressor of the Income Tax Act, a burner charity, if you will, but behind them, who was actually giving the money to them, we had a good snapshot of what that looked like. And so from there, what we felt was for, you know, specifically for activist campaigns, that this might be of interest, right? Rather than um, the importance of finding the next burner in line, the next sort of like playing that whack-a-mole game in terms of who is actually funding uh, uh, activity in the occupied West Bank, who is funding support for the IDF, who is transgressing the charitable, uh, you know, charitable organizations and the Income Tax Act, certainly important. But what we found might be also of interest and also important is who is actually giving that money to them to do that? And what kinds of pressures can be put on these established, you know, ultra rich found private foundation owners back here in Canada? And so this might be a, a clear step that could be taken. Um, and so that was our driving factor there. Who is actually giving this money? And perhaps where else are they giving it to? What might we uncover? Um, what we found when we started querying in this reverse generated uh, questioning, it became, became a parent earner. And so it was not um, just there doing a job and then poof, it's gone when it gets audited and redacted. And rather that this money seemed to have waves to it. And that Beit Olaf uh, was merely one in a, in a chain of synchronous burners. And that when one got you know, pressure, regulatory uh, requirements placed upon it by the CRA, it would simply dissolve to be uh, that. And the, the private foundation money would shift as the next one in line uh, became activated, as it were. And so in tracking these private foundation monies, we identified a precursor burner, Gates of Mercy, which had had regulatory pressure put on it in 2012, and then watching that foundation money shift over to Beth Olaf in 2012. 
and then watching Beit Olaf get uh, audited and its charitable status revoked in 2018, 2019, and then watching that exact same money move uh, down swinging into Beit Olaf and then a new wave into the Jewish Heritage Foundation. And so tracing the movement of private foundation derived money became very, um, uh, what, uh, it, it was very interesting to say the least to see how these burners were actually operating in a series. And the Jewish Heritage Foundation, despite um, ourselves reminding or alerting the CRA that this may be a new uh, a burner in this succession, uh, remains active. Um, we developed a typology for what we call these burner charities, right? Uh, number one, over 75% of the funds that they receive leave Canada. Number two, there's a rapid increase in charitable activity from virtually nothing to millions to tens of millions of dollars within two fiscal years. Number three, their administrative costs are less than 1% of their yearly fiscal activity. And number four, there's a very limited financial liability and related to their expenditures. So what we found is these things are literally running out of people's homes, right? Some of the top earning charities in Canada in terms of dollar donations are literally essentially fly-by-night organizations running out of private homes. There's no infrastructure. They're not looking actively for your donations. And so they don't really resonate as something that, you know, as the, you know, quote unquote, average Canadian would even understand as being, yeah, this, this fits the, the understanding for me of a charitable organization. Instead, it's something else entirely, right? Uh, the fifth criteria, which the question mark by it is, again, viewing this multi-year multi -period, multi period of dormancy which appears to establish a credit scoring under unknown Canada Revenue Agency risk matrices, potentially. Like, why are they doing this? Not sure yet. And number six, uh, with a question mark, but probably you could put that with an explanation mark, is there appears to be absolutely zero interest in regulatory here in charity. And when they're alerted to the fact, you know, not that they didn't know necessarily that they're out of compliance with the Income Tax Act, uh, there, it, it becomes sort of a stalling game where the lawyers get involved, uh, challenges to stop, etc. And so they are able to operate for a period of uh, out of compliance for between, you know, five and 10 years from being first identified, from being first audited for sort of legal wrangling. Uh, they're able to keep moving in this, get as much money out of the country as possible until that audit in, is triggered and enforced. And so that's what it looked like from our capacity and what that sort of suggests, at least from um, if the CRA, if we consider them a good bureaucratic actor that's simply sort of understaffed at this point and interested in, you know, reinvigorating, um, you know, quality to what we perceive in Canada as, you know, the, the concept of charity as being, you know, arguably a good one, but at least something that we can uh, reputably assume is, is acting within compliance of the letter of the law. This might be criteria that they could then look at, you know, if they need outside help, we're here, obviously, uh, to, to preemptively uh, perceive of what might be a transgressor charity before this type of, you know, action takes place. Uh, beyond that, what was also interesting to us was that while um, <clears throat> these burner charities do appear to uh, represent an ongoing phenomenon, right, they're not going away anytime soon. There is the potential of working with the CRA towards preemptively identifying uh, where and how they exist and ideally, you know, uh, getting some help for them for algorithms, etc, where they can stop this before it starts. Uh, but we also suggested that family fortunes associated with private foundations that financially underwrite these burners, as I was saying earlier, may be more uh, salient objectives for activists on the ground, right? In each case, where we're talking about Gates and Mercy, Bait Olaf, and the JHF, donations from these private foundations represented approximately 50% of a burner's totally yearly revenue. And so the next step for us was to see if a core network of private foundations were actually anchoring the operations of Gates and Mercy, Bait Olaf, and the JHF, or whether this was merely just a phenomenon that was taking place. Um, of the hundreds of foundations that were donating to Gates and Mercy, Bait, Olaf, and the JHF, we developed a list for inclusion for CRA query for that first piece or that second piece that I was talking about where we were going to find out who they were giving to. 
And so towards identifying long-term and financially significant donors, people that were involved knowingly and on a long-term basis with keeping these burners operating and moving tens of millions of dollars could uh, out of a very large list of several hundred, we excluded foundations initially that had donated less than $5,000 to bathe Olaf or had donated for less than three years to bathe Olaf. Let's say they just made a mistake. They had been solicited. They didn't really know where the money was going, et cetera, right? Who knows? But we identified 114 potential anchors out of that from a list of 301. <clears throat> Within this pool, at that point, we were merely focusing on Bait Olaf. Within this pool, we identified, we winnowed it down to a further 40 private foundations that had consistent donating patterns across the three burners. So there, what we did is we obtained donation pattern records, T1236 qualified donation worksheets for those interested, for these 40 represented, and we've sent out requests for them. We found 15 more private foundations that had significant overlaps of personnel at the board of director levels, bringing our total to 55 charities, private foundations linked to family fortunes in Canada that we believed were anchoring the operations of these burner charities. So what we found was year by year, the anchor foundations represented less than 50% of the total number of foundations donating, but accounted for a disproportionate amount of foundation funding. For example, in 2017, 48 of these anchors donated $16.7 million to Bait Olaf, accounting for 60% of all private donation found, uh, funding, while comprising just 33% of the total foundation donors. So we thought we were onto something here. Most of these private and public foundations gave only intermittently to one or more of these uh, burner charities, but the anchor foundations displayed consistent patterns of giving, which pivoted nearly simultaneously to whenever one of these subsequent burner charities was cracked down by the CRA. In 2012, they shifted from Gates of Mercy to Bait Olaf, as I said, and in 2018, 2019, they shifted their money appear, uh, apparently in synchronicity out of Beth Ola and into the JHF. <clears throat> and so in the possibilities for action, right? While 55 anchors were identified, it's actually even a smaller number than that, right? Because 30 of these anchors appeared to operate within seven distinct assemblages. By this, we mean they had a near or total overlap of board of directors. And so you've got family fortunes, uh, creating numerous and multiple private foundations to spread the money around. These were networked organizations tied to root family fortunes, in this case of wealthy Toronto-based real estate corporations. And this interlinkage may help explain that synchronous movement that we're seeing. These are several uh, fortunes that are moving tens of millions of dollars out of the country per year uh, using these synchronously organized burner charities, appearing to move their money in unison. <clears throat> it also contained the potential, our research, of identifying a limited number of donors with community ties, right, with financial relationship to these burner charities. The burners, for their part, you know, while we need to be actively pursuing them, once they become subject finally to regulatory pressure through, you know, public comment, through complaint to the CRA, or through the CRA finally being able to red flag these things, uh, action does appear to take place, but they also appear to be fairly easily replaceable under the current regulatory regime, right? The next one is coming. Uh, anchors, however, tied to communities, concrete assets, uh, et cetera, may be uh, a novel and susceptible uh, to activist pressure, right, towards altering their exposed donation patterns. And so that was one of the hopes for this research was that you could, I, we could identify uh, new places for activism to take place rather than shutting down the latest, the latest, the latest with uh, sadly, no doubt, will, you know, create a new one. Um, these, these anchors here are more foundational, right? They have uh, you know, family fortunes, they have, you know, uh, buildings all over the country located specifically in the GTA. And um, we also envisioned, you know, at, at best, perhaps some, some solidarity, because a lot of these anchors, a lot of these real estate fortunes are tied to some of the, you know, the lowest income neighborhoods in the GTA. 
And so um, affordable housing, uh, activists on the ground in those campaigns, uh, we saw the potential for solidarity with anti or decolonial actions in Palestine. And so um, there's a, the article itself again is open access. I won't bother with trying to sort of share the screen at this point and, and, and fumbling through something here. Uh, but there's a supplementary material table that I urge you to check out at the very bottom of that um, article, which again, hopefully is in a link somewhere. Um, and you can see literally the, the, uh, the, the names of the real estate corporations that are involved and the dollar by dollar amount that they've put into these burner charities uh, since the days of Gates of Mercy and since is, which is actively going on in the JHF. So the objectives potentially, if this is of interest to uh, solidarity campaigns uh, is right there. And so um, I thank you for your time and uh, that's where I'll leave you. Wow, thank you, Shane. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miles. Okay, great. Perfect. Goodness. Um, thank you, Miles, for doing that uh, terrific, rigorous research. So impressive, so valuable, but also so startling. Um, I think we've all been taking um, copious notes. And um, yeah, it's really critical to begin to understand this phenomenon and the way that these charities, these burner charities, as you as you call them, um, allow these foundations to move money to these foreign agents and the weak penalties too, you know, the ways that they remain shielded from Canadian law. So I think we're all learning. Um, please do find out more by following Miles' work. And, um, and you can start by reading his publication, uh, International Cash Conduits and Real Estate Empires, a case study in Canadian philanthropic crime, which he co-authored uh, with Paul Silvestre in the Journal of White Collar and Corporate Crimes. And this, um, this can be accessed on, online. Thank you so much, Miles. Looking forward to hearing more from you in the Q&A. Our next speaker of the evening is Shane Martinez. Shane is a barrister and solicitor criminal lawyer with a passion for social justice and human rights. Shane regularly writes and lectures about police brutality, racial profiling, the police, the prison industrial complex, and transnational labor. Um, <clears throat> Shane is going to be highlighting how law and campaigns come together uh, in regards to advocacy work in support of justice for Palestine. And he uh, he's also an adjunct professor um, of pr uh, prison law, policy and reform at uh, York University's Osgoode. Hall Law School. Welcome, Shane. Thanks very much, Bianca. And uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to join such an esteemed panel and, uh, and much gratitude to the organizers as well for, for putting together such a great event. Um, this evening, I'm going to be addressing the continuing problem of organizations in Canada obtaining charitable status and then using funds to supplement services that are provided by Israel's Ministry of Defense. Uh, in, in other words, directly or indirectly financing Israel's armed forces. Now, to, to provide a, a bit of a roadmap for my remarks, first I'm going to address what Canadian law and policy says about using charitable donations to fund foreign armies. Second, I'm going to speak to a few examples of organizations with charitable status which allegedly use donations in a manner that benefits the Israeli armed forces. And third, I'll comment on what this means for the integrity of our legal system here uh, if we allow it to continue. Now, I apologize in advance also for any mispronunciation of Hebrew or Arabic words. So uh, what can you say about this issue? Well, uh, the, Can the Canada Revenue Agency is responsible for enforcing the law as it relates to charities in Canada. And it should be noted that Canadian law and CRA policy require that charitable organizations maintain control over how their funds are used, because this helps to ensure that charitable donations are being used in a manner that uh, complies with the law and are being used for a charitable purpose. Um, simply put, the law uh, says that charities cannot be used as conduits for other non-charitable organizations or, or causes. Uh, Canadian registered charity, charities, uh, which carry on activities abroad, um, are provided with direction from the CRA uh, through a, a document that's called Guidance Document CG002. And part of it states, uh, under Canadian law, most activities that are charitable in Canada are also charitable abroad. However, the courts have stated that some activities that are charitable in Canada may not be charitable when carried on in a different country. 
For example, it is charitable to increase the effectiveness and efficiency of Canada's armed forces, but it is not charitable to support the armed forces of another country. Uh, we also know that uh, although it's quite rare, uh, charities have lost their status in the past uh, for using money in a manner that supports the Israeli armed forces. Uh, one example of that is the 2002 case of uh, Canadian Magan David Autumn for Israel uh, versus uh, the Minister of National Revenue. And in that matter, uh, the organization appealed the decision of the Minister of National Revenue, which sought to revoke its registration as a charitable organization. Um, it had been alleged that uh, there were ambulances that had been donated um, by the organization um, that had been used by the IDF in the occupied territories uh, to transport armed personnel and ammunition, among other things. Um, the appeal by the former charity was denied. Uh, the court held that it was well established that an organization will not be charitable in law if its activities are illegal or contrary to public policy. And although the court did not agree that the activity was contrary to public policy um, due to Canada's preferential treatment of Israel uh, and the strategic partnership with Israel as well, it nevertheless concluded that the minister had legitimate grounds to revoke charitable status, um, uh, given that the ambulances that were being sent over for IDF use, um, the charity here had no, no longer had any control or say over how those ambulances were being used. So effectively they were collecting money and then uh, uh, or they were collecting resources in this instance and sending it abroad um, and having no control over, over how it was being used and allowing the IDF to, to use it for their purposes. Now, despite this precedent uh, in quite clear language uh, from the CRA since that decision, um, which I mentioned earlier, uh, we still see that Canada is a major hub uh, for the solicitation of supposedly charitable donations that are used in a manner that directly or indirectly supports uh, the Israeli armed forces. Uh, now, I'm going to move on to a few examples of groups which allegedly collect charitable donations and then apply them uh, in a manner that benefits the IDF. Uh, the first is Beit Halohem, uh, which uh, claims that it is committed to rehabilitating, rebuilding, and enhancing the lives of over 50,000 Israelis disabled in the line of duty or through acts of terror. Now, this mandate that it has practically mirrors the mandate upon which the Rehabilitation Department of Israel's Ministry of Defense uh, operates on. Now, their mandate states that they exist for the purpose of uh, providing efficient professional services to assist in reintegrating our injured veterans into Israeli society and civilian life. In other words, uh, money is being raised uh, in a way that appears to be subsidizing services that are already provided by Israel's Ministry of Defense, um, the ministry which oversees its armed forces. Uh, Beit Halohem's activities also seem to extend beyond rehabilitation services, though. Um, documentation that's published by the Israeli government suggests that Beit Halohem uh, provides housing to active duty lone soldiers uh, who are enlisted in the IDF. Um, the organization also hosts conferences, although those appear to be about much more than just injured soldiers, and they uh, seem to serve as promotional and networking events uh, for the IDF. And in addition to this, uh, Beit Halohem uh, appears to provide scholarships for IDF veterans as well. And that's a very commonplace activity that I'm going to talk a bit more about um, that's provided by a number of groups. Another group that provides um, this kind of subsidization of education is HESEG. Um, and this is one of the more widely known registered charities that funnels money to supplement another service provided by Israel's Ministry of Defense. And what is that service? Well, it's education. Uh, HESEG sends millions of dollars uh, to Israel uh, every year for scholarships for IDF veterans. Um, one of the problems with this is that post-secondary education um, for individuals trans transitioning from military service to civilian life is already a need that's contemplated and addressed by the Israeli government. Uh, their Ministry of Defense operates what's called the Foundation and Unit for Discharged Soldiers, which is, quote, the national authority responsible for providing assistance, benefits, and services to soldiers released from their services in the IDF. Uh, now, the services and benefits provided by the Foundation and Unit for Discharged Soldiers um, they facilitate a smooth transition back into civilian life, and they're available for up to five years after uh, one has completed their services. Um, 
what we see here is that uh, the foundation and unit for discharged soldiers, it takes a very proactive uh, role in the lives of IDF veterans. And it says that it is, quote, committed to reaching as many of the country's discharged soldiers and service members as possible, informing them of their rights and benefits and helping them reintegrate into civilian life. So the question then arises, why is the Canadian government allowing a registered charity to subsidize the operations of Israel's Ministry of Defense and cover the costs of services that it is responsible for providing to soldiers discharged from its armed forces. Um, now that takes us third and finally to uh, the last example, which is the Canadian Zionist Cultural Association or CZCA. Now this is a much more complex operation. Um, and it's also the, the subject of a complaint, an ongoing complaint to the CRA, which is actually filed by uh, one of my co-panelists this evening, um, uh, Halid Momar. Uh, so he was one of the, the co-complainants on, on that complaint to the CRA. And uh, an entire presentation has been done about that complaint uh, in the past. Um, and there's a great deal to unpack about it, but I'm gonna try and focus on some of the more recent findings which were submitted to the CRA because there was an addendum to the original complaint that went in. Uh, the CZCA uh, is an organization based here in Canada. It describes its activities as uh, running a, a family camp in Israel, uh, uh, operating kindergartens and synagogues and providing scholarships for high school students, um, food packages and running a ski program. Um, what it has apparently been less open about in our respectful position in the complaint to the CRA is about the fact that it was sending millions of dollars to a non-charitable organization uh, called Yahad um, for projects that benefited or supported the IDF by absorbing costs that Israel's armed forces would otherwise be responsible for. Now, Yahad is led by a retired high-ranking uh, Israeli military official, a number of them actually, uh, and has all of its overhead costs financed by the Ministry of Defense. Uh, and, it, or, and it advertises, uh, Yahad advertises that 100% of all donations are utilized for their objectives, the IDF's objectives, without any overhead. Um, so it is very clearly, in, in our uh, respectful submission, uh, a fundraising hub uh, for IDF soldiers and the IDF itself. Um, money goes towards uh, building and infrastructure projects on military bases, um, renovating soldiers' bunkhouses and gyms, sports fields, so on and so forth. Um, and if the nature of the relationship between the CZCA and Yahad and the IDF was in any doubt, the IDF dispelled that um, when you looked at its website previously, where it stated in no uncertain terms that the Canadian Zionist uh, Cultural Association uh, was authorized to raise donations for the IDF. It actually said that on its website. Um, now, as soon as word of the complaint to the CRA became public, what happened? Well, word get back to the IDF very quickly, and it actually removed that reference from its website. Uh, somewhat transparent there. Uh, so the CZCA also reports funneling money um, to a uh, Duvdevin scholarship and mentorship program. Now, this program serves to benefit individuals who served within something known as Unit 217 of the IDF, which I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's also known as Duvdevin. Uh, that's the undercover commando unit within the Israeli military that's known for disguising itself and blending in with Palestinian populations in the occupied territories when they carry out operations, uh, presumably like the operations that we recently saw in, in Janine. Um, scholarships um, are based on financial need and excellence during military service. Uh, the Israel-based Duvdevin uh, Foundation, um, which gets money, uh, from the CZCA and operates the, the scholarship program and mentorship program says that the CZCA is a partner organization, um, which recognizes it for tax benefit purposes. Again, very transparent, very clear what's going on. Uh, and the CZCA is not only one of the funders of the Duvdevin Scholarship, but it also funds a mentoring program known as the Duvdevin Networking Club, which provides uh, alumni with an opportunity to join the Duvdevin Alumni Network. Uh, so it allows for soldiers to just kind of get together, network, build bonds outside of the military, as if there's a charitable purpose behind that. Now, 
It's our submission that neither scholarships contingent on foreign military service nor mentoring programs for uh, alumni commandos of a foreign army have any discernible charitable, pur charitable purpose whatsoever. And for decades, Duvdevin has been the subject of widespread uh, international criticism from uh, an, for because of an array of uh, uh, human rights violations, including uh, extrajudicial executions. Um, now, similarly, uh, the CZCA scholarship um, at the uh, Shamoon College of Engineering in Israel grants scholarships um, to combat and combat support uh, soldiers. So what we see there is a criteria for a scholarship that is in part based on seeing combat. Again, trying to reconcile that with a charitable purpose um, appears to be quite difficult. Um, just to wrap things up, uh, another one of the funds that the CZCA uh, funnels donations to is known as the Uniform to University Scholarship. This is a project um, that was initiated by the IDF Chief of Staff. Uh, and according to Yahad, um, this scholarship is a joint project of Yahad and the Department for Discharged Soldiers within the Ministry of Defense. Um, so there's really no question whatsoever that these scholarship programs uh, benefit the Israeli military. In fact, um, you know, uh, individuals who are at the heads of them, for example, the individual who's at the head of uh, Yahad's US-based branch, said that, uh, that these projects help the Israeli army by uh, encouraging youth to enlist, um, and it makes sure that uh, uh, its soldiers are able to earn valuable uh, degrees. And it's also been reported as well that it's a top priority for the IDF to make sure that soldiers have um, these, uh, these scholarships when they leave because it encourages them to complete their military service. Now, to sum up, um, I, I would really uh, commend Miles uh, and, and his colleague for, for doing the research that they've done uh, it, because it's no secret that kind of chasing this money around and chasing uh, these, these uh, purported charitable organizations um, can become like a game of whack-a-mole. Um, because if one organization loses its status, uh, another burner uh, or similar organization can arise. Now, the ones that I've explained, um, I wouldn't classify them as burners, um, but nevertheless, if they lose their status, uh, it's, it's, you know, there's no question that the money will simply go elsewhere. So it's important to be able to kind of trace the money back to its very source. Um, and when we have the Canadian government refusing to enforce its own law um, and uphold the policy of the CRA to take any kind of measures um, to, to kind of proactively confront an issue that it knows is a widespread problem, um, that is, that's really nothing short of, uh, of shameful, especially in light of the ongoing uh, investigation by the International Criminal Court uh, about alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity committed by the IDF. So um, although this is something that I, I think many people find to be uh, um, you know, uh, outrageous uh, and angering, um, we, we have to make sure that we translate that into action and that people uh, channel um, that energy to raise their voices and call for immediate investigations and also to call for enforcement action um, whenever violations are found. So thank you very much. Thank you, Shane. Um, so important to be calling for action um, around these issues. And um, we do have some actions that we're going to be sharing with you a little bit later on in the discussion. Um, thank you so much, Shane. That was an awesome presentation. And you've done so, so much to shed light on these organizations that are associated with the Israeli military and also, and also settlements. Um, so I think it's really important to highlight your uh, remarkable lawyering skills and uh, and also your role in the case um, that ultimately uh, Sarel Canada uh, compelled Sarel Canada to attend court and respond to allegations that it uh, violated the Foreign Enlistment Act. So congratulations on that. Um, Karen's also put information about the CZCA case in the chat um, and you can find out more about this uh, at Just Peace Advocates website. We also have a uh, some previous webinars, including one called Subsidizing Apartheid uh, that you can find on YouTube. All right, so our final speaker of the evening is Khaled Muammar. Um, Khaled is a Christian Palestinian Canadian who was forced to flee his hometown Nazareth in 1948. He is one of the founders of the Canadian Arab Federation and a former member of the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada. Khaled is one of the complainants to the CRA in regard to Canadian organizations acting as conduits for Israeli military and settler organizations. Welcome, Khaled. 
Well, I think you're still muted. Hold on, let me see if I can help. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear okay. you. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I would like to add to what uh, Shane said, that it's really shameful that uh, our country here is allowing charitable organizations uh, to send money to organizations uh, in a country which, are, which already is uh, practicing racism against uh, the Palestinian people. Uh, and I would like to focus uh, on Regabim in this case uh, and focus on uh, how this money that's going from the charitable organizations is affecting the Palestinian citizens of Israel who number about 2 million. Uh, what, what, uh, what we should recall is that in 1948, the Palestinians who remained behind were only 150,000. And uh, at this, uh, at, at, as of today, they number about 2 million citizens. However, the amount of land that they have under their control remained the same. 3% and uh, it is actually more restricted now. For example, in the case of Nazareth in 1948, the population of Nazareth was 10,000 people. Today it's 80,000 people. And uh, the, the amount of land remained the same. So there's congestion, there's no place to build. There are no parks in Nazareth. I was in, uh, in, in Palestine in July and August for 55 days, and I could see how the, the, the streets are tight. There is no place to park. Uh, there are no parks, no children, no playgrounds. Uh, the, uh, on top of that, a part of Nazareth in 1948 was confiscated, was expropriated, by the, uh, by the state of Israel to create Nazareth elite, which now has changed its name to North Hagalil, which means uh, a view of the Galilee, because they did not want to be associated with, uh, with Christian Nazareth. So they, they said, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not the Nazareth of Jesus, you know, we are different. So this, uh, uh, this new town of uh, North Hagalil has half the population of Nazareth, but twice the area, the municipal area. So you could see that Nazareth is really crowded four times more than North Hagali. Uh, and on top of that, uh, the, the government has very restrictive uh, permits for buildings. So it, they make it very hard for Palestinian citizens to build, uh, to uh, to build, or even to add to add an, a, a, a section to their house without a permit. So currently, in all of Palis of, of Israel proper, there are sixty thousand homes that are not connected to the Israeli power grid. So these people, the, the reason they're not connected is because they don't have um, a building permit. That affects 130,000 of the 2 million Palestinian citizens. Uh, until now, they have been able to manage not to have these homes demolished because as citizens, they've been uh, able to go to courts to uh, postpone the demolitions. But now we have uh, a party, the uh, religious Zionist party of Bezalel Smotrich, who is a founder of Regabim. And, Regab, and the policy of this new government has stated clearly that uh, their role is to, uh, to ensure that uh, the land of Israel is the exclusive property of the Jewish people. And they are going to insist and follow up to ensure that all these 60,000 homes, which have no building permits, will be taken to court. They will, they will put pressure on the courts 
on the legislature, on the military, on the administration to, to, to take action against these 60,000 homes with no building permits. So this is a really threat to the, uh, to the presence of Palestinians in the Galilee specifically and in the Negev, because these are the two areas where most of the building permits uh, have not been granted. And uh, when, when, uh, when we look at that situation, it's really uh, very shameful that we have our country supporting now uh, the possibility that these 60,000 homes could be demolished because money is going in, in the millions of dollars from many charitable organizations in Canada to uh, organizations like Regabim who could ultimately uh, bring about the dispossession of 130,000 people. And uh, I would like to also go back in history and say Nazareth itself survived uh, dispossession and destruction in 1948. But that was by accident, actually, because at that time, the commander of the 7th Brigade who was sent to destroy the city uh, refused to follow the orders. And uh, he was a wise uh, Canadian Jew, actually, who realized that if such an action is taking place, it would damage the reputation of this new racist state. And his name was Ben Denkelman. His father was the founder of the Tip Top Taylor's Empire. And uh, so the city of Nadares survived, you know, internal displacement and destruction. But this same commander, by the way, treated, uh, you know, he did not follow the orders in the case of Nazareth because it was a predominantly Christian town, but he did not hesitate to destroy Sephoria, which was six kilometers away, which had a population of 5,000, half the number of the population of Nazareth, or the town of Ma'lul, which is another 600, six kilometers away, which had a population of 1,000, because both of these towns had a majority of Muslim citizens. So again, it shows you the racism and the systemic discrimination that is uh, practiced by Israel and by, by groups like Regabim and others against Palestinian citizens of Israel and specifically those who belong to the Muslim to Islam. As long as you do not belong to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the privileged religious ethnic group, you face you face dispossession and humiliation and mistreatment in all of Palestine. And therefore, any money that comes from Canada through charitable organizations to organizations like Rigavim and others make, complicit, make Canada complicit in the crimes and discriminations being committed against my people in Palestine. And I saw the demolition in Ma'lul Malul, uh, everything was demolished in Malul. The, the only things that survived was two churches. And that's because the church's property are owned by the local church. But the mosque in Malul was completely demolished and misused for cattle and, uh, and, uh, and other animals because it was a Muslim, it's a mosque. And under Islam, the properties of the mosques in Israel proper were under the administration of the Waqf in Jerusalem, which at that time was under Jordanian uh, control. So, so, uh, so Muslim, all Muslim properties which, were, uh, which belonged to the Waqf in the villages which were destroyed were completely lost and people could not come back and touch them. The churches in Malul, at least, people were able to go and pray during Christmas and even have weddings 
and events in them, but they were not allowed to build anything on the grounds of the village. And they were not even allowed to visit the cemeteries. So in, in, in a final statement, uh, the dangers faced by the Palestinian citizens of Israel is now has intensified. They are going to be facing a pressure to squeeze them even more into uh, smaller places in the Negev. They've moved, they, they want to move people from more than 40 villages into, uh, into congregated ghettoized uh, towns so that they can prevent them from using any state land. And uh, currently 93% of the country is actually land that is administered by the Israel uh, uh, by the Israel Land Authority. And uh, this, this will not change with the, what we have now. And the only kind of thing that will uh, uh, send a message to, uh, to Israel and to any organizations there is for our government to, um, to apply its own laws regarding charitable organizations and not to be silent and not to take time uh, and, and require people to pressure them and work all the time, because this is a violation of Canadian laws and yet our government that is not taking action. At the same time, it makes our country complicit in the mistreatment and the suffering of 2 million Palestinian citizens of Israel who, who are second class citizens and on top of that now are facing dispossession and demolitions of their homes, about 130,000 of them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Khaled. Um, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for giving us the details as well from your recent travels um, about the conditions in Palestine right now and also about what we should expect in the near future. The, you know, highlighting uh, the case of Regavim. And of course, thank you so much for your long uh, and important role in, uh, in the work of Palestinian liberation. So as you've heard today, um, Khaled and Rabbi David Mimvisser submitted a detailed complaint to the CRA, the Canada Revenue, Revenue Agency, concerning the Neiman Foundation Canada. Um, so we've, we do have an action that we would like to encourage you to take. Um, it just takes about a minute to email the CRA to demand that they audit the charitable status of this foundation, which funds organizations promoting West Bank settlements, racist policies, and the Israeli military. So please do take action. The link for that is, is in the chat. Karen has put it in there. I also want to let the audience know um, that if you are part of a group, you can also sign on to the Colonialism is Not Charity campaign, um, which now has over 35 groups on board uh, thus far. Um, and you can also endorse defund uh, racism. So we are now in the Q&A period of the evening. Um, thank you very much to those of you who placed your questions in the Q&A box. I can see a number here. Um, and we had a couple of questions as well, which were submitted in advance. So the first question that we have here um, is, how do we find out about which Canadian charities are supporting Palestinian dispossession? And uh, maybe I'll start with you, uh, Bana, um, given your involvement in the campaign. Um, thank you very much um, also to everybody. I was taking notes diligently, so just want to say that your work is, is marvelous. Um, according to this, uh, to the, the, in fact, the conversations we've had, uh, and according to the speakers, it's, it's very simple, really. Uh, there are various foundations, and you can easily uh, uh, look at their tax uh, audits after, of course, you ask uh, the, you know, CRA or the Canadian Revenue Agency for that information. And some of this stuff, again, is also public. So, you can look into that uh, easily and, and find this information yourself. If you are curious to know whether a foundation is in support of any organization, 
in uh, Israel, I think it might be uh, helpful to search for that foundation. You might just find it uh, in our website, in fact, uh, listed at you know one of the foundations that is sending money uh, to Israeli uh, government and, uh, and or settler organizations and foundations, IDF and whatnot. Or you may find information in uh, uh, articles that uh, a lot of the speakers have, you know, uh, mentioned. So, and in, if you are also interested to look into any of this information, you can also send us uh, an email at um, uh, the, you know, Good Shepherd Collective, or send us even a, a DM at Twitter if you'd like, and then we'd look into that information ourselves and, and give you that information if you'd like. Thank you. That's so uh, helpful, Bana. I also just want to thank Bana, who's um, up way past uh, bedtime. It's past midnight um, where you are. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that. Does anyone else have anything to contribute to that question? Um, if not, I'm going to go to the next one, which is, um, I think, for Miles. Um, it's from Eileen, who wants to know, uh, was Beth Olaf fined or did they have to repay anything, asks Eileen. Uh, it's my understanding the way it works is that um, I have, you know, some experience reviewing Canadian tax law, um, you know, challenges in court. Uh, when it comes to situations like Beth Oloth, no, you have your license revoked. So uh, there's certain individuals that we found were also linked by board of directorships, trustees, uh, secretaries, et cetera, from all three actually uh, burner charities that we identified. And so having your license revoked doesn't even necessarily mean under Canadian law that you can't just go ahead and open uh, the next charity in line. Um, I believe the other penalty is that you have to give back 110% of your uh, assets in your final year of operation. And so that's quickly circumvented by just liquidating your assets. And so uh, no, it's been my sort of understanding of how uh, the tax law works is when there's when there's instances where uh, a charity is set up specifically for some kind of uh, money making scheme whereby you can't simply justify that this money went somewhere and oh you don't know where it went sorry um, then nothing happens but when there's money when there's a charity set up for a, a specific scam where donors are solicited, where you can give in kind, and then, you know, pharmaceuticals will be overvalued or, you know, all these different types of scam. When we paid all us was not, this was not actually a situation. Then the CRA will go after you to recover costs because they were not given with the intention of giving a gift. But when it came to Beth Olaf, no, it's my understanding, no money was, there's no money at all was uh, attempted to be recovered. No. My apologies. Um, another question, I think sort of a technical question for Shane. Um, Asma would like to know, are IDF charity funded services for veterans include, uh, do they include um, Israelis who participated in their mandatory military service for the IDF? Do you know the answer to that, Shane? Yeah, I do. Um, so IDF uh, funded services are both for those who completed compulsory services, but also for uh, lone soldiers who contemplate remaining uh, in Israel and the occupied territories following the completion of their service. Um, and in fact, back in 2016, uh, the Israeli military had announced um, that it would be fully funding the academic studies of both uh, combat and non-combat soldiers upon discharge um, from uh, the IDF through their uh, universe, excuse me, a uniform to university uh, scholarship program. Uh, and that is a, a scholarship program that Canadian charities contribute to. Um, and the program pays for two thirds of soldiers education. Um, the remaining uh, portion is paid by uh, post-military grants um, from the Ministry of Defense. And uh, this fund actually, um, the, the funding from the Ministry of Defense, it's not a new initiative. 
And uh, these kinds of grants have been provided actually um, to IDF veterans since 1949. And it helps them not only pay for uh, college education, um, but it has also been used in the past to cover wedding expenses, um, opening and buying businesses, or uh, buying a home in Israel as well, um, or occupied territories. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's something that is used to both um, benefit uh, individuals who are, um, completing their service compulsory uh, or those who volunteer to go over as long soldiers. Thank you, Shane. Um, the next question that I have here is from Catherine who wants to know whether all the links appearing throughout the chat will be provided. Yes, they will be. They'll be in an email that will be sent to uh, all of you who have registered um, uh, via Zoom. So check your emails. You'll get that either tomorrow or the day after that. Um, the next question that we have, which was um, submitted um, by uh, Anonymous, is, um, is a question about a new federal government body that's been launched to fight Islamophobia, um, with the appointee being Amira Al-Gawabi. El 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 and um, this person wants to know whether such a body can raise the voices of Palestinians. Will there be self-censorship? Would speaking up for Palestine result in sacking? Um, I think I'll uh, I'll ask Khaled uh, what what he thinks about this. You need to unmute. It's still it's still on mute. Yeah. Oh, it's still it's back on mute. I'm so sorry, Khaled. I don't know. Can you, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Perfect. Well, actually, this uh, this brings up. Uh, a more uh, an, another important issue, which is the fact that apartheid Israel to to uh, to be able to cover up its crimes against the Palestinian people is doing two things, which are harming both Jews and Muslims. The first one is by by equating uh, Israel with world jewelry and 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 saying that if if, if you criticize Israel. It means you hate Jews. So by that, by that, by, by doing that, they are actually implying that Jews are responsible for the crimes of Israel and are promoting, are, are encouraging racists to say, you know, all Jews are bad like apartheid Israel. That's the first thing. The second thing that they're doing, because we live in a Christian society and Western Europe, is Christian too, is to uh, to promote hatred of Muslims by by trying to project to project this this uh, cause, the Palestinian cause, as a religious cause. You know, it's Muslims who uh, who are threatening Jews, and the, these same Muslims are threatening Christianity in Europe and North America, and uh, so. I, I suspect it's going to be, it, it, it will require a courageous person or a courageous organization, Muslim organization, to stand up and speak in defense of Palestinian rights. Uh, because we do have ministers in, in the cabinet who are Muslims, but they don't really <laughs> speak that much in reality about uh, what is happening. And they, and they haven't been able even to pressure the government in which they sit as ministers to come up and say what Israel is doing is what is apartheid, you know, a state which says that you have to belong to a certain religious ethnic group, you will have privileges. If you don't belong to that uh, religious ethnic group, you don't count. So. I do hope that Amira will have the uh, courage and determination and the commitment to speak out and uh, and tackle, you know, apartheid and systemic discrimination. She's being inflected on indigenous Palestinian Semites. After all, Palestinians are really Semites, uh, and we can prove that we are we are indigenous and we are Semites. And we just happen not to belong to the correct, between brackets, religious ethnic group that 
uh, Zionism uh, determines to be uh, to have supremacy between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. So let us uh, be optimistic and hope that uh, this uh, this uh, special envoy on Islamophobia would also deal with uh, with the promotion that Israel is fostering uh, by by accusing Muslims of being uh, terrorists and haters of Jews, and at the same time accusing the Palestinians because 90% or 95% of Palestinians are actually Muslims. Thank you, Khaled. The next question that we have is from Ella M, uh, who wants to know, who says settler colonialism threatens indigenous peoples and ecosystems in so many territories around the world. What strategies do you see as important to share and collaborate around? Um, how can UN declarations and covenants be better leveraged? So for this question, maybe I'll start with the lawyers, Catherine and Shane, what do you, what do you think? How can, how can UN declarations and covenants be better leveraged? Is that, is that relevant to this question? I think it's, I mean, I'll, take, I'll take a stab at this. I mean, it's a huge question. Um, it, of course they're important, but I think what this is getting at is a larger um, culture in international law and international policy involving political will and a lot of, of um, sorry, it's just such a huge question. I'm trying to <laughs> think how to best to approach it. I mean, Israel's in a unique place because it's allied with the United States, which is obviously part of the Security Council. So the General Assembly and many UN resolutions and many different treaty bodies have passed you know, plenty of opinions and declarations and international, you know, statements and laws. Um, but unfortunately, because all international law isn't directly, direct, sorry, directly um, enforced through any sort of global mechanism, it all has to be supported through a variety of means, such as soft law and um, international collaboration. So. UN declarations are important because they do establish a crystallized norm and, and different international standards that we're going to hold ourselves and other states accountable to. However, we live in a very unequal world, especially when it comes to international law. Certain states are going to be held to a higher standard than others, and our enforcement mechanisms that are in place are going to be used in some states more than others. I mean, Israel has gotten a pass for a lot of its international crimes for years because of its international connections to the United States, for example. Um, so I'm not saying they're not important, they are important. I do think they allow people and advocates and lawyers to, to leverage international law and, and highlight that there is a, a, you know, um, a set standard of international law, legal norm that has been violated, um, which continues to breed you know, a greater, I guess, dossier of evidence against, you know, these against international crimes and in human rights laws. Um, and I find that people tend to be very disheartened about this news because it's, uh, it's never an answer that it's not helpful because it is, but it's going to take so much more. And as, and as, as I highlighted earlier, you know, there's a whole private industry, the private sector and businesses that really play a huge role in this and they're pretty much exempt from international law. I mean, of course, there are guiding principles and there's, you know, budding treaties that are being drafted to deal with transnational corporations, but it's it's messy, it's not clear, it's very frustrating, and it's really going to take efforts on all sides to bring about any sort of international um, action on this. And um, I know that's a very frustrating answer, but today maybe you want to build off of that. I'll, I'll try my best. I, I actually agree with a lot of uh, what, what Catherine's saying. I think she hit the nail on the head. Um, I mean, I don't know if if UN declarations and covenants can really be leveraged in terms of the Canadian government, um, in terms of direct engagement with the government, right? Like what we've seen, you know, we look at this government's track record at the UN and its, vote, its voting record on issues relating to Palestine it makes it pretty clear that the Canadian government doesn't care a whole lot about uh, international law and even agreements that it's 
signatory to. Um, one example of that is the uh, the Arms Trade Treaty, right, which says that um, uh, state parties, of which Canada is one, um, are not to provide arms to countries uh, if they know that those arms would be used in the commission of uh, crimes against humanity uh, or war crimes. Um, who's under investigation right now for exactly those types of crimes? Well, Israel is, right? And what do we see? Well, we see that Canada is at a 30-year high right now in terms of uh, trading uh, uh, weapons to Israel and selling weapons to Israel. Um, so, you know, clearly that they don't take that, that commitment seriously. Um, you know, however, uh, I think that uh, that these kinds of declarations and covenants, you know, even though they're not determinative of legal proceedings here in Canada, if we try to raise them, they can occasionally have what we call persuasive value with with the courts, right, with some jurists. Um, so, you know, you know, there are cases, including um, some that I'm involved with at the moment, um, where we are referencing uh, international treaties and agreements. And, uh, you know, I'm remaining cautiously optimistic that the court will, will give those sufficient consideration when deciding the issues before it. Um, but it is, uh, it, it can be a, a tricky area to, to maneuver for the reasons that Catherine set out. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so we're nearing the end of our time together. So I think I'm going to focus on the uh, last two, on just two more questions that are sort of action oriented. Um, the first is how can peace on, on the subject of, of weapons, how can peace organizers across Canada meaningfully contribute to solidarity and resistance with Palestinians? Are there any networks where peace movements can connect and work together in solidarity? I think I'll direct this to, uh, to, to Bana and uh, Khaled. Uh, actually, in, in, in Canada, uh, there are there are various uh, Arab organizations and others like uh, like uh, Just Peace Advocates, uh, Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East, and then there's the Palestinian Canadian Congress, uh, Canadian Arab Federation. Uh, but I think uh, I think that the the Arab and Palestinian groups do not have yet the uh, the, the mechanism and the methods to reach out to the community and to their supporters to mobilize them sufficiently. While uh, while groups like the, the CGPME and Just Peace Advocates have been more successful. Because uh, these are tools which should be used uh, through uh, social media, also through Facebook and Twitter, and uh, and actually uh, to be engaged all the time. Because I find uh, I find on Twitter like Bob Bray is always putting out you know things on Twitter, uh, feeling sorry for Ukraine, for the Rohingyas, for uh, for the uh, Uyghurs in China, but he always is, ignores completely Palestine, and he's always at the United Nations, uh, as, you know, re representing Canada by voting against most of the resolutions in support of Palestine. And uh, so these are things uh, where. Uh, uh, you know there is there is enough now. There are enough. There is public support in Canada, but there is no there is not enough organizational power to really Im, uh, impact the members of parliament. Because in the end, the politicians at the top uh, are will not listen unless then they lose seats in the elections. And I was looking at uh, statistics showing that you know uh, minorities in Canada and that includes religious and racial and ethnic minorities made up of immigrants who now comprise who by 2025 will comprise 30 percent population can can influence nearly 150 seats in Canada because they would have a voting power between 20 and 50 percent so they can make a difference of which party will win. And they will start listening to MPs who are voted into power by a population. Until that happens, uh, 
unfortunately, we've seen the Liberal Party has gone backward in its support for Palestine. It was better in the time of uh, the father, Pierre Trudeau and Chrétien. Uh, Canada now follows the American policies and stand on everything. Vana, do you have any thoughts? Yes, um, I would like to add maybe like three things. Um, first thing is, of course, education is very important. Uh, I would urge everybody to read the, the very articles that have been shared and talked about today, because specifically that we all need to be aware of these uh, uh, cases and specific, you know, uh, organizations and their, uh, uh, their links to Israeli um, colonial system. And I would also uh, think that the second thing is that I do believe like legal precedents are very important. So if we can establish more legal precedents where uh, more organizations status like charitable statuses are being revoked for X and Y reasons, then we can say that uh, uh, perhaps writing a letter um, to the CRA could actually be quite helpful. So if people can do that, uh, just these advocates are doing a great uh, job with this campaign, you can uh, write a letter and then uh, hopefully a uh, complaint. And then that's, this will you know, urge the, the CRA to actually uh, um, to act and hopefully uh, revoke the charitable status of these organization, which is the end goal and that uh, sets a precedent again if it's uh, for, for various reasons for different organizations again. And the third thing, of course, being part of the Good Shepherd Collective, I do invite you all to join the Defund Racism campaign. You, If you are an organization, you can endorse the campaign. If you are an individual and want to support the campaign, you can uh, find our petition on, web, on our website uh, and look for our um, long-term strategy uh, fighting these organizations and, and including, you know, Regavim and Air David, which were mentioned today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bana. And uh, I see that Karen put in the chat also that there are uh, 20 uh, Palestinian solidarity groups uh, in the Canadian BDS coalition. So you can check that out as well at bdscoalition.ca and see if there's a group in your area as well you can reach out to. Um, so the last question that we have here, which has been partially answered, um, but I think it's a good one to end on is what can we do to expose these and other charities supporting Israeli colonialism? What, what should we be doing? And uh, I'm going to put this out to everyone. We haven't heard from you, Miles, in a, in a while. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and, and anyone else's. Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm hopeful. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, beyond that, yeah, I, I know it takes uh, person power, willpower, uh, etc. But within the specific context of like, uh, I guess the the findings that I, I was you know fortunate enough to bring to the table again, like bringing it back to those big heavy donors who have those uh, you know concrete assets in the community who are going to, you know, call the GTA home in this case, who are not going anywhere soon, um, beyond writing to the CRA, beyond, um, you know, all these, all these positive campaigns that are going on to shut down the next charity that is transgressing, that is, uh, you know, acting in such unsavory and, and horrific manners. I really believe that if the appetite is there, putting that kind of pressure on those donors, on those big time, uh, you know, multimillionaire, uh, billionaire donors, taking it to their places of work, uh, you know, getting active and, and making it unpalatable to be uh, moving your money in these directions is like a huge piece. Um, again, I'm not in uh, the GTA, uh, I, I'm not on the ground, unfortunately, on these campaigns. And so I'm not going to, you know, recommend for other people to put themselves into positions of danger that I'm not capable of putting myself into. But if I were putting on my activist hat and thinking about that, yeah, I would, I would go get that, um, that supplementary materials table at the bottom of the article it clearly identifies like, you know, seven big time family fortunes who are like, 
you know, associated with concrete uh, assets in the GTA. Make it, uh, make it unsavory. Make it known that we know what you're doing with your money uh, is morally unjust and is, you know, when we're talking about natural law, is uh, totally runs against, uh, you know, the concept of charity. Um, and so is there the people power to do that? Uh, can that be a rallying cry? Uh, I certainly hope so, but that's where I would take it. And I think that that's, um, yeah, I'm certainly prepared to discuss that further, but uh, that'd be my recommendation. <clears throat> Thank you, Miles. Any other thoughts um, before we close out for tonight? Um, um, what, another, what can people another do? Another thing was, uh has been done in the past is, you know, to find some MPs, a couple of MPs who could uh, bring those up in, uh, in Parliament and, uh, and mention uh, maybe a specific organization which has one of those uh, big donors and bring it up, you know, publicly in Parliament uh, and follow it up with, uh, with, uh, with, with, you know, with, with, uh, support and you know public support thank you thank you Kala. that's a great suggestion um any other any other thoughts uh catherine shane vana what should people do anything else uh i i would say don't be shy about trying to uh get lawyers to back up whatever's happening on the ground right i mean i think that is uh one of the most important things we can do uh as as legal counsel is to not lead the struggle but to to back up those who are organizing in our communities and are, are kind of leading this at the forefront and mobilizing people um don't be for you know if you if you know somebody that you think is going to be uh sympathetic and have an open ear you know, don't be shy to try and bring them into the fold and to say, hey, we're working on these campaigns. Can you assist us? You know, what kind of law do you practice? Is this something you might be able to help out with? Um, uh, to, to try and kind of bring in those skill sets and, and put them to use. Um, you know, we saw that similar tactics and networking and, and, and leveraging, uh, you know, those kinds of professions uh, was a great assistance in making apartheid fall in South Africa, right? So there's no reason why we, we shouldn't be doing that again here. So. That would be that would be my two cents. Uh, Hold the lawyers accountable. Get them involved. <laughs> That's an excellent suggestion. Also, speaking of pressure, please do take the action um, that we're suggesting and email the CRA, Canadian Revenue Agency, to demand that they audit the charitable status of the Neiman Foundation Canada, which funds organizations that promote but settlements, racist policies, and the Israeli military. This is not charity. Um, so I want to thank you all so, so, so much. We've come to the end of colonialism is not charity. Um, that was a very important discussion. Hopefully uh, many more will follow. We've covered quite a bit of critical ground today. Lots of notes taken. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are rebroadcasting this discussion to both YouTube and Facebook. So subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll get notifications. Subscribe to our Twitter and our Facebook um, for news and updates. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to educate yourself on this topic. Um, please do share the recording um, with others. As Khaled said, uh, stay engaged, keep informed. Uh, this is a great form of solidarity. Um, and if you like discussions like these, please do consider donating to the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. We are completely dependent on people like you to keep going uh, and educating around these critical topics. So it's been a great event. Thanks again to our panelists. You're brilliant, Bana, Catherine, Khaled, Miles, and Shane. Please find out more about their work, their activism. And, um, and again, remember to take that action. If you're part of a group, you can also sign on to Colonialism is Not Charity Campaign, and you can endorse Defund Racism. I also want to thank once more Karen Rodman from Just Peace Advocates for her excellent organizing, for pulling this panel together. Um, thanks to the Good Shepherd Collective. Thanks to Defund Racism for co-sponsoring. Just Peace Advocates, and thanks to the wonderful, engaged audience for your comments and your questions. Let's keep working uh, for peace and opposing uh, war and occupation, uh, freedom for Palestine, and, and peace, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Anka. Thank you. Bye -bye.